Good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Lenny Orlov. I will be your host today. Uh, I'm the age-friendly Seattle program coordinator here in the human services department. Uh, today, we're going to meet a panel of better hearing advocates, get updates on COVID-19, and hear from the Seattle Public Library. Make sure, though, to please stay till the very, very end to learn about all the resources and upcoming events. And if this programming brings you value, it, it, it makes you happy or uh, it's important to you, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, which is at Aging King County on the YouTube uh, platform. As you may have noticed, today we are using American Sign Language Interpretation. We have two interpreters, so every 10 to 15 minutes, we'll pause for about 10 to 15 seconds and do a shift change. During that time, there will be no audio in the presentation, so don't be alarmed that there is a silence. We really do appreciate you, you being here with us and we also appreciate the land that we're on. And so what we always like to start with is a land acknowledgement. At Seattle Human Services, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. We want to encourage you to please visit www.duwamishtribe.org to learn more about the Duwamish, people of the inside, people who are still here, and find out how you can get involved. Thank you very much. Uh, and the next slide, please. Thank you. So May, among other things, is Better Hearing Month. The other things are Older Americans Month, but more on that later. For Better Hearing Month, our Mayor Jenny Durkin and the Seattle City Council issued a proclamation that proclaims May 2021 as Better Hearing Month in Seattle. And as part of that, they encourage all Seattle residents to take time this month to talk with family members and medical providers about hearing loss and get a hearing test if one is recommended. Wear earplugs to protect hearing when volumes are loud. And use microphones and hearing assistive devices at public meetings. Also, and we're gonna do some of that today, learn about best practices when communicating with anyone with hearing loss. You can view the full text at the link that we're going to share in the live Q&A. It's at seattle.gov forward slash documents forward slash departments forward slash age friendly. And then it's all one word, better hearing month 2021 proclamation dot PDF. Apologies for the uh, very long URL there. We will be sure to include it in our a description on, on the YouTube when we post this recording. So with thanks to the mayor and, and the council for this proclamation, uh, let's move on to the next slide. So again, today we begin celebrating Better Hearing Month. And we have a very special 90 minute panel. These events are usually one hour, but today we'll be here for 90 minutes uh, or maybe five minutes less than 90. Uh, we'll meet Diana Thompson from the Advisory Council on Aging and Disability Services for Seattle and King County. We'll meet Sherry Perizzoli, who is with the Washington chapter on Hearing Loss Association of America. Uh, and we'll meet Dr. Brad Ingro, Director of Audiology at Hearing, Speech and Deaf Center. Uh, We'll also, as I mentioned here, a brief update from the Seattle Public Library uh, and an update on COVID-19 and vaccinations. So um, if you've never been here before, again, please consider subscribing for, for more videos like this. 
But what are we? What is age friendly? Uh, it, it's this worldwide movement about making communities all around the world, right? It's about making them better places to grow up and grow old. We work uh, on that in municipalities usually. So city of Seattle has an action plan that goes along eight domains of livability, which uh, outline what, uh, you know, what things can be improved around the city. It's transportation and communication and, and housing um, and civic and social participation. Um, so uh, those can be found at our website uh, at seattle.gov forward slash AFS, which stands for Age Friendly Seattle. Uh, and uh, part of that commitment uh, is accessible communication. Um, you're witnessing uh, ASL interpretation but also we are committed to language access in our programming. You may have noticed there's a gear underneath this video, whether you're watching the recording or the live event. Uh, and by clicking that gear, you have access to closed captioning in English and six other languages. And those are Arabic, Chinese, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. We realize not everybody has access to the internet. So another way to, you know, get to this information is by calling 206-686-8357 and then entering uh, a conference ID, which is what they're going to ask you for, and that's 224-689-164. Why am I telling you the phone number if you're already online? That's because uh, maybe you have a friend who, um, you know, who can still join this meeting. It's it's 90 minutes. So there's still plenty of time to join us both online and on the phone. So do share it with somebody who you think will benefit from this information. And with that, uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. So regardless of uh, how you or your friends are joining us today, this is about connecting community um, during these times where we're asked to you know, do more things c closer to our homes. We, uh, we're beginning to open up and more on that later, but uh, it, it, it's important that the social isolation is, does not have as much of an effect as we have seen it have over the past year uh, and change. Uh, so community leaders, such as the panel that you'll be hearing from today is, uh, is who we'd like to bring to, you know, the community elders uh, in Seattle and King County. Um, so um, the way this will work today is we have three moderators uh, in the studio whom you may or may not see because we're trying this new way of, uh, uh, of uh, running this event, uh, but, but they're working hard and they're Meg Wolf, Justin England, uh, and Gita Hamam. And they're all with the human services department here at the city of Seattle. If you're joining us by phone, by the way, you may need to uh, press star six uh, when we ask you uh, to state your question. And, and we'll go to the phones as soon as we're done with each um, sort of portion of our event. So after the library presentation, we'll pause briefly and go to the phones. And that's a cue for those of you online to start typing in your questions. For all I know, you may already have questions for human services, for, for our esteemed uh, panel. Please go ahead and put those in. Our moderators, whose pictures you see on the screen, will receive those um, and they will go ahead and publish them with a note. We will pass this along to the presenter. But if there is a question that goes beyond human services and beyond today's presentation, please know that there is a uh, a network of community organizations in Seattle and King County called Community Living Connections. They have information about services and resources such as food and meals, uh, and uh, those can all be received through organizations in your community. So you can, you know, if you, if you go to communityLivingConnections.org, 
you can see what organizations exist in your community and, and walk in and request assistance with uh, various things. The phone number for that uh, organization is, or that group of organization is 1-844-348-5464. We, we hope that you will pass that along to uh, your friends. And uh, with that, let's move on to the next slide. Quick announcement, this is close to home, but we do have another program on the third Thursday. Today is the first Thursday. On the third Thursday, we have a sister program called the Civic Coffee Hour. And the difference is, you've heard about what Age Friendly Seattle uh, is and wants to uh, and aspires to do. Civic Coffee Hour uh, serves as a platform for uh, older adults in Seattle and King County to, uh, connect with government decision makers. And, and this month also being Older Americans Month, we'll hear from the planning unit manager in Aging and Disability Services and Human Services Department, Andrea Yip, and from Dick Wu, who is the chair of the Advisory Council on Aging and Disability Services for Seattle and King County. So uh, please mark your calendars for two weeks from now, 520 at 10.30 a.m., also a 90-minute panel, and access information is all the same. And, and both the Coffee Hour and Close to Home are produced in partnership with the Seattle Public Library. This started back in 2020, where we had plans of hosting these in person in their great spaces over at the Central Branch. And we hope to get back to that very, very soon, though it just hasn't happened yet. So, uh, one thing that we are continuing as part of this partnership is providing information about the library. And the next slide, please. We're going to hear now from Nancy Sloat, Older Adults Program Manager at the Seattle Public Library. Uh, let me uh, find Nancy uh, and bring her uh, on, on the live show here. Uh, and we'll also have an interpreter change. And Nancy, you're on. Oh, thank you so much, Lenny. Um, and good morning, everyone. I'm always so happy to have a few minutes before our program to talk about what's new at um, the library. We so appreciate um, our partnership with Age Friendly um, and uh, an, opp talk, uh, an opportunity to talk about also how the library um, looks at its services and programs and tries to make them age-friendly and accessible. Uh, could I have the next slide? So I know everybody has been waiting for the branches to actually open in person and yay, they opened last week, three branches. It's our first time for opening them for in uh, in branch services, in person services. They're the Beacon Hill and the Lake City and the Southwest libraries. Um, these are sort of our pilot libraries. We're going to work out all the details of how it will work to have in person services. And uh, with the next slide, if you could change it, um, these are the things that you can expect to find inside those three branches. First of all, we will have computers. We won't have as many computers um, as uh, you might be used to because we need to space them out. Of course, you'll have access to Wi-Fi. You can bring in your own devices um, there. You can even charge your devices, which will be great. You can scan documents. Uh, staff will scan and photocopy uh, materials for you. Um, of course, you can pick up your holds. That's another thing. You can just sit. If you want to, you can uh, get a library card or talk to a staff member about your library account. Um, could I have the next slide? For the moment, um, um, those are the services that we have. Um, I know people would love to be able to kind of browse the stacks. That's really pretty fun, but we're not quite there yet and ready to do that. So these branches are going to be open from Tuesday through Saturday from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. And there will be open periods and closed periods throughout the day. And the closed periods 
will allow the staff to clean um, the buildings. Um, and so uh, because things are changing quickly and new branches are opening for in person, you can always go to the library's website, which is www.spl.org, or you can call our phone line, which is our quick information at 206-386-4636. Or if you prefer to email or chat electronically with staff, you can um, go to www.spl.org slash ask. We have great staff who um, just are full of information and can quickly find you the specific information that you need about a particular branch and what services are there. Um, okay, the next slide. So in addition to the three open branches, we have since last summer have a curbside pickup. Um, and uh, that means you can place a hold on materials in the catalog. You wait for the notice or the phone call that the materials are there, and then you go to that branch to pick up your materials. And that's worked really well. Um, we have 16 branches now that have curbside pickup. Um, the newest branch is the West Seattle branch. For so, for any of you who live um, in the in the West Seattle area, you'll be happy to know that. Um, and one reminder is that if it's difficult to wait online um, to pick up your holds, or it's difficult to get out of the car, um, you can in fact um, call the the branch, and the branch um, will check out your materials for you and bring them out to your car. So I just wanted to make sure that people knew that and that we do have those kinds of accessible services. Um, could I have the next slide? So one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was a special program that we have in the library, Program of Services, called LEAP, which stands for Library Equal Access Program. And we had a nifty little video to show you, but unfortunately we had some tech issues. So I will just sort of summarize what was in the video and tell you a little bit about LEAP. So LEAP started way back in the 1980s, and its goal was to make the library as accessible as possible to people um, who are blind or deaf or blind deaf, hearing with hearing issues, um, and people also who might have physical disabilities as well. We have a special lab at the Central Library called the LEAP Lab, which has all kinds of equipment and sort of accessibility software. Because the Central Library is still actually closed to in-person, you know, the branches that are open, we have accessibility software like magnifiers and uh, Zoom and JAWS, um, all uh, available at um, the branches. And um, the Southwest branch, one of the open branches, also has a special Braille keyboard and translator, things like that. So please, if you're interested in that and want to find out more information, you can go to our website or go to um, our quick information line again. Um, so in order to get a hold of LEAP staff, our moderators are going to put that information into the chat, but you can email leap at spl.org or you can leave a phone message at 206-615-1380 and staff will get back to you via relay and you'll be able to talk to them, have any of your questions answered um, there. So that was our library equal access program. I'm glad I could talk about that specifically um, this month where we're having better hearing month than the current panel. Um, could I have the next slide? Oh, well, I know it's only about another week, but we still have tax forms available at the branches at all the curbside locations. And even if you miss the deadline in a week, we always can help you get tax forms from the IRS website. So you're always, you're, you always have that option. 
uh, could I have the next slide? So one of the services that the library has, and I don't think as many people know about this as maybe others of our programs, is we have a whole series of library podcasts of some of our author events, um, like Seattle Reads, when all of Seattle reads the same book and discusses it, or um, Seattle Writes, where we have authors talking about the writing process, or one of my favorite, Thrilling Tales, we have a wonderful librarian, and you can see his picture there on the screen, David, who uh, comes out of a theater career, and he does, um, really, he calls it Story Times for Adults, and you can find those pod podcasts on the library's website. Just enter podcasts in the search bar, and you will find those. And then finally, I just wanted to mention, um, if you could go to the next slide, um, a couple of great upcoming author programs, which will be podcasts. So if you can't make them on the dates of the actual program, um, we have a wonderful author, Jewel Parker Rhodes, um, who will be discussing her book called Magic City on May 12th at 6 p.m. And her book, while it's an old book, it was published in the 1990s, was about the um, Tulsa massacre in 1921, which destroyed a thriving um, black neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is the 100th anniversary of that massacre. And then on uh, May 25th, uh, we have um, a, a yearly um, history. We bring a prominent um, historian um, and uh, to the library. And Michelle Duster will be talking about Ida B. Wells Barnett, who Ida B. Wells was born in the 19th century. She was born enslaved, and she later became an, an activist and a journalist, and she exposed in the teens and the 1920s the horrendous um, legacy and ongoing activity of lynchings um, throughout the United States. So I welcome you to come to those programs or listen to them on podcasts. And then uh, next slide, please. So to end, I just want to invite you to visit the uh, library's website that has programs for older adults, um, of interest to older adults. Um, we call our program Next Chapter, and that website is www.spl.org forward slash next chapter. And then my final slide is my contact information, and I am delighted to talk with anybody. You can get a hold of me via my email, and we'll put that into the chat. So thank you very much for um, uh, joining and uh, listening to this brief a summary of what's going on in the library, and I'm so happy to answer any questions now or later. Thanks, Lenny. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, at this time, we are going to uh, do an interpreter change. Before our main event, I, I do want to give a brief update uh, on the state of COVID-19 uh, in King County. Uh, we just heard an announcement by uh, the governor of Washington, James Lee, that we will be staying in phase three sort of on hold for another two weeks, even though uh, there, uh, there is uh, an increase of cases. But the hope is that with the increase in vaccinations, um, th that that plateauing may uh, end up uh, uh, being a decrease, and then we, you know, uh, it would be possible for the county to remain in, in phase three. Uh, currently, though, um, it, it it's not uh, it's not happening, and the experts, epidemiologists at the University of Washington, are suggesting that if everybody who hasn't yet received the vaccination uh, for coronavirus received it in the next, you know, started the process, since it's a two-shot process for, uh, for for two of the vaccines, they started today, then by 4th of July, we could really have a, a very nice way to celebrate. And as you 
Probably no eligibility has been expended to anybody 16 and over, uh, and many places are starting to accept walk-ins. And we just heard the news that Pfizer is due to uh, hopefully approve the vaccine for uh, children 12 and older as uh, early as uh, next week. So we'll certainly look for that. But um, what I have on the slide here, and apologies for the small print, is the uh, Washington State Coronavirus Response website. It's at coronavirus.wa.gov. And, and you can, you know, if you bookmark that site, you can always come back here for the latest information. Um, and the information on it hasn't changed much uh, in the uh, past, you know, a month or so since we last spoke about it, with one important exception. There is now a link to fill out a form uh, in case you or someone you know is homebound, they're, uh, they're offering to bring the vaccinations uh, to you. Now, I want to note in, in the spirit of language access that this website, including the vaccine locator button that you see there, uh, if you click one of the languages that uh, you speak at home at the top, and it's over 30 languages there, uh, that button does change to then your language, which is really great and we appreciate that. However, the homebound form is only available in English. So, so just an FYI on that. Another way, next slide please, is, uh, is to find out this information by phone. The Washington State set up a, a hotline. Uh, it's, it's information hotline about coronavirus in general, but you can also find out about vaccination locations there as well. The, the phone number there is 1-800-525-0127. Uh, and if that number is busy, you can call 1-888-856-5816. They are open Monday through Friday, and then um, actually on weekends and observe state holidays. So um, certainly a lot of availability there. Uh, another important phone number to share with you is Washington Listens. That's different than the information hotline. It's for anybody who is experiencing stress related to COVID-19. Uh, that number is 1-833-681-0211. Uh, it's open Monday through Friday, nine to nine, and on weekends, nine to six uh, Pacific Standard Time. And uh, we do encourage you to make a note of both of these phone numbers um, and uh, uh, and pass them along to folks who you think might benefit from them. Uh, so with that, I would like to, um, uh, next slide please, introduce my next speakers or our featured speakers today. Uh, I will go ahead and introduce uh, all of them right now so that then later as the panelists switch out, we don't have to pause. Uh, first up, I'm going to introduce uh, Brad Ingro. Dr. Brad Ingro grew up with severe hearing loss in his family and has been a, a tell it like it is advocate for deaf and hard of hearing people for 30 years. In his current role as director of audiology at HSDC, Hearing, uh, hearing Speech and Deaf Center, he is exploring innovative ways to reach traditionally underserved populations with hearing loss and push the technology envelope to make hearing improvement more affordable and accessible. Uh, very, uh, very pleased to have uh, Dr. Ingro here. Uh, our uh, second panelist is Sherry Perizzoli. Uh, she was diagnosed with moderate hearing loss in her late teens and has been advocating for hearing access and support for over 35 years. Sherry is on the Hearing Loss Association of America, HLAA Board of Directors, is chair of the HLAA Get in the Hearing Loop program, and she also founded Let's Loop Seattle to bring hearing loops to Washington State. Sherry is currently president of the Hearing Loss Association of America, Washington State Association, HLAA WA. Welcome to the panel, Sherry. And last but not least, and I believe she will be our first speaker, uh, is Diana Thompson. She is 
the member of uh, the Advisory Council on Aging and Disability Services, which you know I, I represent and the folks uh, who are moderating today as well for Seattle and King County. Diana has noise-induced hearing loss stemming from playing and practicing musical instruments, flute, piccolo, and piano. An active hearing advocate, she previously served on the Washington State Board of Hearing and Speech and currently represents the HLWA on the Dementia Action Collaborative. So Diana, uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to move you to the stage as we do an interpreter change here. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is fine. Thank you, Lenny, for the nice introduction. And thank you, everybody who's attending today. I expect we are speaking to a variety of people, hearing aid users like myself, who have dealt with hearing loss for many years, attendees who are considering buying hearing aids, persons who very much want family or friends to seek hearing help, Grandparents who worry that their grandchildren will damage their hearing by listening to very loud music. And finally, attendees who just like to learn things. I hope our presentation will help you all. Next slide. Okay, we are seeing some uh, statistics on the screen and obviously uh, the older you get, the more apt you are to have the, uh, the uh, hearing loss. If this uh, graph was extended, they would say, if you are 85 or older, you have an 80% chance of having a hearing loss. I wanted to give you some additional statistics. Men ages 20 to 69 are nearly twice as likely to have hearing loss as women. Can you think of why? Historically, men are more apt to have been exposed to noise. Many have worked in noisy factories, mowed the lawn, worked with power tools, or served in the armed forces. And finally, one more statistic. Less than 30% of persons age 70 or older that could benefit from hearing aids have ever used them. Can you think of why? I expect probably what your response is, the cost of hearing aids. And I wanted to share you some in, with you some information I think would be useful. The website of the Hearing Loss Association of Washington has suggestions of financial help to buy hearing aids. And also Congress in 2017, in order to make hearing aids more available to people and cheaper, passed a law which created government regulated over-the-counter hearing aids for persons with mild to moderate hearing loss. Unfortunately, the law doesn't go into, the, into effect until the FDA, which is a government uh, department, develops regulations and they haven't done it yet. And we're trying to exert pressure so those get done and these over-the-counter over hearing aids will be available. Next slide. Well, as can be seen from the screen, hearing loss has a big impact on your life. In terms of communicating with family and friends, you may no longer be able to talk to somebody from the next room, chat while the water is running, or hear your eight-year-old grandson who's talking to you from the back of the car, and he won't be very happy. Next, communication in noisy environments. With hearing loss, understanding in noisy environments becomes a real challenge and sometimes an impossibility. Thus, you will have difficulty hearing or be unable to understand at a restaurant or a cocktail party. The television set. In terms of TV, if you have hearing loss, you may need, may need it to be much louder than anybody else in the room, which can cause problems. Using phones. Persons with hearing loss, unfortunately, have difficulty understanding 
or are unable to understand on a phone. And what I believe is that the phones today don't have acoustics nearly as good as they used to be. Maybe I'm prejudiced because of my hearing loss. Understanding at a lecture or class. When you understand your lecture or class and have hearing loss, it can be a great challenge. To hear, you may need to sit in the front row. And for many people, that doesn't work either. To understand the lecturer, you may need the room to have a microphone or an assisted listening system. Unfortunately, these two devices, these devices often are not available. And finally, hearing at virtual meetings, such as when you go to meetings on the internet, you may find that you can't understand some or all of the participants or just miss the most important words in sentences. And these are sad, but fortunately, there are solutions to these problems, which both Brad and Sherry will be discussing later, so that even though you have the hearing loss, you can meet it and have a successful life. Next uh, slide. Social isolation, loneliness, depression, cognitive decline in dementia and falls are some uh, conditions that are associated with hearing loss. If you have hearing loss, there's a greater chance that you may have one of those conditions or more than one of those conditions. And it seems quite logical that the greater your hearing loss, the more you are likely to become socially isolated, lonely, or depressed. It's really hard to converse and relate to others when you can't understand what they're saying. More research is needed to determine whether hearing treatment can prevent or delay the conditions on the slide. My personal belief is that hearing treatment can have a positive impact. At this time, it's unknown whether or not hearing aids can prevent or delay dementia or cognitive decline. An ongoing study at John Hopkins may give us the answer. Nevertheless, although at this time we don't know the answer, many hearing professionals advertise that hearing aids may or will prevent dementia or cognitive decline. However, even though some things are not known, here are some facts that are clear. Hearing aids can help most people hear and understand better. Second, hearing loss can be mistaken for dementia. Thus, it's really important to have a hearing test prior to an evaluation for dementia. And finally, depending in part upon the progression of the illness, some persons with dementia can benefit from hearing aids and other forms of amplification. And caregivers benefit when persons uh, that are doing the uh, doing the caregiving can un uh, okay I'm messing up on the sentence and caregivers benefit when the person they are caring for can understand what that what what uh, is being said. Next slide. It's important to know how to communicate with persons with hearing loss. The slide gives some very useful suggestions. Get listeners' attention. Face directly. This enables the person you are talking with to get visual cues from your face and mouth. Number two, avoid noisy backgrounds. Choose a well-lit setting. It's particularly difficult for a person with hearing loss to hear a waiter at a restaurant or other people when eating at a restaurant. And then there's the problem of the car. When you're a passenger in the car, it's very difficult to understand what the driver is saying to you or the people in the back seat are saying. Be patient, don't shout. Speaking too loud can distort sound. Also, don't talk too quickly. Next, rephrase if, you, if not understood. Often repetition doesn't work. Why? Well, using myself as an example, there are letters in the alphabet 
I can never hear or distinguish. Finally, don't cover your mouth or chew food or smoke when talking to a person with hearing loss. People with hearing loss read your face and lips, even if they're not conscious of doing so. I studied Spanish and Latin America and was very surprised to find out that I could read in Spanish as well as English. Next, next slide, please. And this slide contains useful suggestions for persons with hearing loss. When you're talking to people that you don't know, you should explain what helps you hear best. This is important. Communication is a two-way street. Next, pay attention. Look for visual cues. Unfortunately, when you have difficult understanding, sometimes you just give up and begin to think about other things, and then you're never going to understand what's being said. Next, choose a quiet, well-lit location. In my days of hearing loss denial, I remember conversing with a neighbor in her backyard, and this was early in the evening. The later it was, the darker it became, and the less I was able to understand her. Unfortunately, I still was afraid to tell her that I didn't understand what she was saying. Let speakers know how they are doing. Everybody likes to be appreciated. Request written clues or information if needed. One should not be afraid to ask for written cues. It's more effective than asking the person with whom you're talking to re repeat things umpteen times. Finally, don't bluff. Admit to not understanding. This is really hard for people with hearing loss. Bluffing is common, but it's an ineffective tool. Also, there's a tendency for a person that has hearing loss to monopolize the conversation when they do not understand what others are saying. If you know all the talking, you just don't have to worry about understanding what the other person is saying. Next slide, please. Loud noises can cause hearing loss and make the hearing loss permanent. 40 million United States adults aged 20 to 69 have noise-induced hearing loss. And as the slide says, the impact of the sound on hearing depends on how loud the sound is, how long you are exposed to the sound, and how close you are to the sound. If possible, please avoid exposure to loud noises. Move away from the noise and turn down the volume. And if you cannot avoid a loud sound, use protective equipment such as earplugs or protective ear muffs. Unfortunately, many people do not recognize or else ignore that loud sounds, including musical instruments, can cause hearing loss. Let me mention my, pro my problems. And yet, I, wa I wanted to be in the Bellevue Orchestra. And the only way I could be in the Bellevue Orchestra was to play both flute and piccolo. And piccolo really pickled my ears. Next slide. Sound is measured in decibels, just as distances are measured in inches, yards, or miles. This slide gives a typical range of the volume of sirens, rock concerts, sporting events, and lawnmowers. It also indicates how long you can listen to that sound before you can have ear damage. For example, look at sirens. They have a volume of between 110 and 129 decibels. Just two minutes of a siren at 110 decibels can cause damage to your ears. Luckily, normal conversation doesn't cause this problem, as the sound of talking is generally just 60 to 70 decibels. 
So please take care of your ears. And now I'm going to turn, o- turn the presentation over to Brad, an audiologist, who will give to you interesting and useful information on ears, hearing, and hearing aids. Okay. I want to thank everybody for um, having us, and thanks, Diana, for that great intro. Um, you know, I think the the big takeaway that I see um, from what Diana was talking about is if you're interested in uh, age-friendly anything, you're probably old enough that you're at risk for hearing loss. And the real benefit of what we, I think, are going to hopefully get across to you today is get a hearing test. How many of us don't know what our hearing levels are? I mean, it's really simple. Now, getting a hearing test seems like an easy thing to do, but um, maybe it's not. So let's take a look and see how we can get a hearing test. Next slide, please. You know, until COVID-19 hit, I used to say, you have to come to my office because that's the only place you'll get a hearing test. And unfortunately, um, that provides me with a nice living, but it doesn't really provide a lot of access to a lot of people. It really does create limitations to people getting at least a decent screening of their hearing. So with COVID, we had to kind of stretch our uh, imagination a little bit of how we can find out how well somebody hears. And so what's neat about the sort of middle to post COVID era is we now have really good options face to face. You can get a, a screening at a physician's office. You can go to a licensed hearing instrument specialist. You can go to an audiologist and have a traditional in-person kind of a hearing test. But what we found through COVID was there really are good and validated ways to at least find out, is hearing impacting your um, your life? And we can do that online. We can do that with questionnaires. We can do it with websites. We can um, have apps on our smartphones. So there's lots of different ways. And what I like about that is part of that 30% of people who have a problem get help that Diana talked about is about access. I really believe that a big part of that is access. So if we provide more flexible options for people to say, in the privacy of their own home, and Sherry's going to talk about this thing called stigma later, but in the privacy of your own home, if I, big macho man, want to check my hearing, I can find that out if I have a hearing problem without anybody else knowing. Next slide, please. So the hearing test really, the way I look at it and the way I've always taught it, kind of starts from the outside in. And the first thing I really want to know is, are these things hanging that I hang my eyeglasses on, are they built for appropriate hearing, right? So if my ear is bent over like that, either from birth or from trauma, that's going to affect my ability to hear and understand. It's also going to affect my ability to take advantage of hearing aid technology. If I got a big plug of wax in my ear the size of my thumb, I bet I'm not going to hear so well, right? So we have to figure that out. If my eardrum is damaged from either a trauma or infection or I was poking around with a Q-tip trying to get that big plug of wax out, that's going to affect my my ability to hear. And if you've ever taken a trip over the pass or you've flown in an airplane or you've gone scuba diving, you know about your eustachian tube. And if you've got a bunch of gunk in the back of your sinuses and your eustachian tube doesn't open regularly and completely, you have fluctuating hearing loss all the time. My uncle, the reason I'm in this field, was a musician who lost his hearing not from loud noise, but from an ear infection caused by a eustachian tube problem that he ignored for 10 years. And he ended up with with an infection of the mastoid bones, which cost him his hearing to save his life. And so in the process of having a conversation with my uncle, his one working eustachian tube used to open and close and get stuck and full of fluid. And I would watch him periodically go, 
And then you could, if you listen, you could hear as the air would escape out of the clog in his ear. Um, and he did a party trick where he would take a drag of a cigarette and blow smoke out of his ears if he was mad at you. <clears throat> but we don't recommend that because that further bothered his ear station too. Um, so we do a whole bunch of tests to, to look at this physical ear. We look in your ear with what's called an otoscope. We do a test where we put some air pressure into your ear and we measure the flexibility of that middle ear system. So that tells me, do I have a foundation to my house? Next slide, please. So here's a little picture. We have to, I was told in graduate school, if you ever do a presentation on hearing to the public, you have to show a picture of the ear. So this is my uh, requisite picture of the ear. Um, nobody's ear looks like that because it's too pretty, but these are all those parts that we're gonna talk, that we just talked about. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the this is the meat and potatoes of it, right? We have to figure out what sounds you can hear and what sounds you can't hear. And it's very interesting to look at how this thing called an audiogram or the graph of hearing was developed because it was really developed not by audiologists and not by physicians and not by anybody re interested in hearing loss. It was really developed based on the work of the telephone company. The telephone company wanted to know how bad the signal could be for the majority of people to be able to pick up the phone and order back then it wasn't a pizza, but I don't know, uh, a hot dish or whatever you used to get delivered to you in the 1920s. But this was trying to say, I've got hearing that's good enough or not good enough, right? Now, the very interesting thing about this was it led to a whole science where we tried to figure out how to measure sound. And when we measured sound, we realized that a person with normal hearing doesn't hear sound flat across the pitch range. They kind of have a sensitivity range that looks sort of like the lower half of the United States. And that became very confusing for everybody to talk about. So we did some fancy math and some fancy statistics, and we turned it into this thing that said, if you have normal hearing, you will hear flat across the top of this graph. And then the world, World War II came out. And after World War II, all these veterans came back with hearing loss, and they wanted financial compensation. And so then the lawyers got in the, in the room, and they said, how good is good enough? And we came up with these crazy categories of hearing loss, normal hearing up to 25 decibels, mild hearing loss up to 40 decibels. Well, in 1984, um, in addition to George Orwell, there was a guy named Pasco who actually looked at the speech energy for each one of these ranges. And what we find is if you have nearly normal or just a mild hearing loss, according to the audiologists, you are able to hear, or if you, you know, then you can hear 90% of an average conversation. That's pretty good, right? That's the, that's the better part of the mild range. If you go to the worst part of the mild range, now you can only hear about 45 to 50% of the, the sounds of speech. So people who have moderate hearing loss can only hear 50% of the energy of a speech signal. Well, if you can only un hear 50% of the, the information, that's pretty not moderate, that's pretty severe, right? If you get to moderately severe, notice these couch terms help the lawyers, but not the person with the hearing loss, moderately severe, you can only hear 10% of the information. So this audiogram can be very, very misleading. And I like to use it as a starting point to have a conversation but be careful when you're talking to people, well, you don't need a hearing, yet, hearing aid yet because you only have a mild hearing loss. Well, let's look at other ways that we can talk about hearing. Next slide, please. So this is that, that range, right? So, but, but again, we have to get to severe before the lawyers think it's a big deal, but yet we don't hear most of a conversation at the moderate level. Next slide. All right, this is where I think we really need to spend more time because I can hear sounds and that's interesting information, 
But if I don't understand the words that are made up of those sounds, then that sound doesn't really help me. And if you know anybody with a hearing loss, you will hear two different groups of people. I hear if it's loud enough. And then there's people who say, well, I hear, but I don't understand. And these are people who get enough volume, but because we don't focus on their ability to turn that volume into meaning, then we don't really address their hearing loss and we don't address all of those impacts that Diana talked about. Because if it's loud enough, if I have, if I can hear my family talking, but what it seems like to me is rah, 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 then I'm not going to have a good relationship with my family. So when we do speech testing, we look at the audibility, how loud it has to be to hear, but we also really look at, can you understand these individual words or sentences? And in the best case scenario, you should ask for, if you have hearing aids, I would like you to test me for speech understanding with and without my hearing aids. Because here's the crazy thing. Sometimes you hear worse. What are you talking about, Dr. Brad? That's impossible. Hearing aids make you hear better. Well, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Next slide, please. So how do I know whether my hearing aids are really helping me hear better or not? And how do I know whether my hearing loss is impacting my life outside of that nice metal box in Dr. Brad's office? Well, I know because hopefully Dr. Brad is smart enough or uh, aware enough to do some evaluation of my needs in the real world. And so there are some tests that we can do, and most of them are questionnaire kinds of tests that allow us to say, for example, when I'm wearing my hearing aids and I'm in a crowded grocery store talking with the cashier, I can follow the conversation. Now, if a person says I can do that 20% of the time, and then I fit them with hearing aids, and two weeks after they get their hearing aids, I give them the same thing, and they say, I can understand the cashier 80% of the time. Then that means in the real world, that hearing aid system helped. If when they start out, they can hear the cashier 40% of the time, and then I give them hearing aids, and they come back and they say, now I can understand the cashier 20% of the time, oops, I did something very, very wrong. So these are tools that are available to all hearing aid providers that's built right into their software system. And it's really, it's, it's something we should look at. But I'm also very, very, very worried that when the doorbell rings for Seattle to bring you your COVID vaccine because you're homebound, you can hear the doorbell. I'm really, really worried that when you take your hearing aids off, you can hear the fire alarm or the the carbon monoxide alarm. And unfortunately, a lot of times we don't ask that question in the hearing test uh, because I'm more worried about when I put my earplugs in, can you push the button? So we really need to think about a bigger picture of hearing testing. Next slide, please. So, okay, I have a hearing loss. I'm going to get hearing aids. Great. Next slide, please. Hearing aids, if you read the newspaper article, uh, advertisements, they're invisible. They eliminate all background noise. They automatically adjust to any, you know, just stick them in your ear, you're good to go. And if you read the current advertisements, you'll never get dementia if you wear a hearing aid. But only if you buy the new one. The old ones don't do it, you got to buy the new ones. Okay, next slide, please. Here's what hearing aids really do. Hearing aids for the most people are reasonably discreet. You have to look pretty hard to find a hearing aid. Now, if you have long hair like Sherry or, uh, or even Diana, I would never find your hearing aid unless I was looking for it. If you're like Lenny and I, we're, you're gonna see our hearing aids, but it's, it's, it's okay. Now, all hearing aids these days make background noise more comfortable to, to function in. That's true. Sometimes you can actually hear better in background noise. Most of the time, it actually just decreases the discomfort. They do automatically adjust, but they only automatically adjust to the settings that the hearing aid company thought about in the, when they designed the hearing aid. For a lot of people, they actually make you hear better. They make sounds louder, and you can understand more words 
than you could without hearing aids. For some people, however, they have very poor hearing. And we have to be realistic that the hearing aid can decrease the disability, but not necessarily make it great. So I use the term less bad because for some people, particularly people would be considering maybe another option like a cochlear implant, hearing aids can't solve their problem by themselves. And I caution people, if the hearing aid can't be shown to make it better than in the test booth, don't keep buying new hearing aids on the promise that the new one will make it better. Make the person prove to you in the booth before they sell it to you that it can make it better. Next slide, please. All right, everybody's seen these advertisements. I will argue that for almost anybody, unless you have a very severe hearing loss, most of these could potentially be a solution if we only think about audibility, if we only think about making it loud enough. However, when we think about the real picture of making speech understanding better to deal with some of the limitations of hearing aids, I feel like the Rick Wright RIE, the reason there's three word names for that, one on the right hand side, is they it's the same hearing aid, but the manufacturers use different names so that the marketing departments can have something to do. But all of these hearing aids make it louder. Not all of them provide you with all of the stuff. I would argue stop thinking about what the hearing aid looks like until you figure out what the hearing aid needs to do for you in what environments. Because we can almost always make it look good, but if we focus on that, we will miss out on some of the better features. Next slide, please. All right, so here's the reality. Every hearing aid, every cochlear implant, whoops, go back one, please. There we go, have limitations and they have to be maintained daily. The, audio, the argument that if you come to my office every three months, I'll take care of your hearing aids and you won't have to do anything is hogwash. You have to take care of your hearing aids every day, just like you gotta brush your teeth every day. You have to wash your glasses every day if you wear glasses, okay? And every single hearing aid will be affected negatively by distance, reverberation, and background noise. Next night, slide, please. So here's the reality, right? If I'm if I'm very close to you, you'll hear me very well. I think we have some uh, timing on those slides that keeps jumping, but that's okay. If I'm within, if I'm within fist bump, we used to say shake handshaking distance. We can't handshake anymore. So if I'm within elbow distance in a COVID safe world, you're going to hear really well, assuming that there's no background noise and assuming that I'm not in a room with a very high ceiling and uh, hardwood floors and lots of windows and all of that, right? So the better my, uh, the curb appeal of my house is, the worse I'm gonna hear, if you think about it from a real estate perspective. Um, so what that means is we can't just depend on these hearing aids. We have to use other technologies. And Sherry's gonna talk more about this um, in, a, in a lot of uh, more detail. But ultimately, what I want you to stop thinking about is, I don't need a hearing aid yet. Don't worry about a hearing, go get your hearing tested, okay? If you're old enough to have a colonoscopy, you're old enough to have a hearing, hearing test. And everybody who's on this call is probably old enough to have a colonoscopy. And I guarantee you the hearing test is more is less uncomfortable than a colonoscopy. Okay, get a hearing evaluation. Find out if you are having difficulty in the real world. Ask your provider, hey, can I have some kind of questionnaire or something that taps into my real world problem? If you need hearing aids, get hearing aids. And then say my hearing aids are the foundation of my house. And now I'm gonna call Sherry Parazzoli, who is going to help me build the rest of my house, which involves a whole lot more than just my hearing aids. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sherry at this point. And I wanna thank you everyone for your time. Sorry, interpreters, I talk fast. I know I'm an old interpreter, I should know better. Uh, there was a quick question that I think we can just go ahead and throw uh, to Brad real quick, and that is, 
uh, is Costco a reliable source for hearing tests and hearing aids? Uh, sure. Let me let me address that. So I used to say to my graduate students, it depends about every time they ask me a question. It depends. Costco has a uh, a good system. They use they used to use kind of off brand hearing aids, and now they use on brand hearing aids. Like anywhere else, you can go to a Costco that has a great provider, whether they're a hearing aid specialist or an audiologist, and they can do an effective evaluation, and you can get a really good solution. You can go to an audiologist and get the same thing or the opposite can be true. So what I would recommend is if you're a member of Costco and that's an option for you, ask to, to have a conversation with that provider, interview them like you would interview a lawyer that you're considering hiring and see how, how comfortable you feel. Ask them about some of the things that Sherry's gonna talk about in a little bit and engage your response but based on their response. I can't say it's universally bad, like a lot of uh, my colleagues want to say, because I've been to Costco's that are great because the provider is great. And I've been to Costco's that are not great because the provider is not great. It's not Costco that's the problem. It's the customer, it's the service. Yeah, you know, this is Diana. I wanted to add something on that. Costco has 180 days that you can try out the hearing aids. And uh, most audiologists have a much shorter period of time. And uh, it's 30 days is what's required by statute. And, and even with the audiologist for the 30 days, there's still a sum of money the audiologist is able to keep. And, and uh, Costco says that it gives you the total amount back again. So uh, that that is a positive thing about about, uh, about Costco, but everything Brad uh, has said also, I agree with. And unlike other things at Costco, you don't have to buy 47,000 hearing aid batteries at, at one time. You, you can buy a smaller package. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you, Brad, for addressing that question. Uh, and apologies to, to Sherry that uh, we're uh, keeping you from, from joining us, but we will uh, get there right now. We're gonna do an interpreter change and there will be silence. Okay, we're ready to go. All righty, okay. Well, thanks everyone. And I, I just wanna piggyback on what Diana and Brad said today. Um, it's it's um, so important that you um, choose your hearing aid and your hearing aid system carefully and that uh, you shop for a hearing aid provider versus um, particularly just a hearing aid. So I'm Sherry and I'm pleased to be here today and to talk to you about healthy aging and hearing loss. Um, Diana, Brad and I are all members of the Hearing Loss Association of America, HLAA. And to help run out the presentation, I was asked to talk to you about HLAA Washington and how we help people with hearing loss and the work that we do to help guide communities to become inclusive, accessible, and hearing friendly. So why is this important? The simple truth is that hearing loss will eventually affect every single one of us, either because we lose our hearing or because a friend or loved one loses their hearing. And hearing loss doesn't just happen to an individual. It happens to families, friends, coworkers, to communities. My hope today is to help you understand that you can learn to live well with hearing loss, how you can help friends and family, and how we as a community can work together to create hearing friendly communities. Next slide, please. When I was in college, I learned that I would lose most of my hearing by midlife. Well, this was traumatic, 
but I got hearing aids and despite the challenges, I wore them because they helped me hear better. And 40 years later, well, today I wear two behind the ear hearing aids with telecoils and all the latest technologies. And still there are times when my world sounds like what this slide represents. Every few letters go unheard, especially sounds with S, T, and H, making it a puzzle to figure out what is being said. Sometimes I get it right, and sometimes what I hear just doesn't make sense. And sometimes what I hear makes sense but it isn't right. And that's when I get into trouble and that causes a communication breakdown. Next slide, please. Fear and shame often come with hearing loss and these emotions are keeping many people from getting the help they need. Because I was afraid of losing the relationships with the people who mattered the most, I chose to face the fear and do something about my hearing loss. Talking openly about my hearing loss was hard at first, and, but doing so allowed me to explore what I needed and to ask for help. And I discovered that most people are willing to help. They're willing to move to a quieter room, to turn down the music, or to use a microphone. Acknowledging my hearing loss made my life so much easier. How we talk about hearing loss matters. Being positive and supportive can have a meaningful effect on the attitudes of the individuals with hearing loss, which in turn can promote action. I'm fortunate that my friends and family have been very supportive over the years. Next slide, please. The professional help that Brad talked about is a central element of hearing health. Yet learning to live well with hearing loss requires much more than getting a hearing aid. Um, finding a community of peers who can understand what you are facing and understand similar struggles can be invaluable. Peer support can be a very effective tool to help erase the stigma of hearing loss and hearing aid use and asking other people to change their behavior so that you can participate. The good news is that HLAA Washington has your back. Next slide, please. Defining the population. Most people develop hearing loss after they've learned speech. They rely on their residual hearing and hearing assistive technologies to stay connected in the hearing world. Very few people like me learn to use ASL. HLAA and HLAA Washington share the same mission, which is to open the world of communication to people with hearing loss through information, education, support, and advocacy. Diana mentioned some of the legislation that HLAA National does, and one of the most important um, bills that was passed was called a Hearing Aid Compatibility Act. And that's important because that is set up so that almost every hearing aid manufacturer sh should create hearing aids that work with any telephone. Because, you know, everyone should be able to use an iPhone. So the hearing aids need to be compatible. For 30 years, HLAA Washington has been providing a community and a roadmap for people in Washington state living with hearing loss. Our goal is to help people at every stage of the hearing loss journey and to help communities become hearing friendly 
through greater communication access. We were all volunteer. If you or someone you love has hearing loss, you're not alone. A good place to start the journey is HLAA and the HLAA Washington website. And you can find that at www.hearingloss.org or www.hearingloss-wa.org. Perhaps even more important, people with hearing loss, we offer support groups that let you talk openly without fearing judgment. Our meetings are accessible with looped meeting rooms and card captions. Our virtual hope groups are led by trained volunteers who also have hearing loss, and the HLAA headquarters offer webinars that address common topics such as employment, parenting, travel, all from the perspective of having hearing loss. Next slide, please. Hearing loss is invisible. It's an invisible disability that makes it easy to ignore. And so the people who are affected are also ignored. The stigma persists because hearing loss is invisible and largely misunderstood. But if we talk about hearing loss, if, accommodate, if we accommodate hearing loss throughout our communities, if we normalize hearing loss, we help the stigma go away. So what can we do? I encourage each of you on this call to do something to help make hearing loss visible. It can be as simple as talking about hearing loss and showing compassion and empathy or get more involved by educating yourself and others and actively advocating for communication access. You can be a hearing loss ambassador. I deeply admire the goals of the Age-Friendly Seattle and the development of Age-Friendly Action Plan. HLAA Washington wants to continue our work with the city to ensure age-friendly means hearing-friendly. Given the extremely high percentages of older adults impacted by hearing loss, the only way we will be able to participate across the identified eight domains of livability is if each domain includes communication access. This is different from just communications. Communications access means that people with sensory disabilities can communicate and be communicated with on equal footing to those who do not have such disabilities. But in every instance where accessibility is a goal, be it transportation, housing, health services, social and civic inclusion, employment, access for people with hearing loss must be included. Next slide. So what does communication access look like? Well, where there is audible communication, there should be an, an amplification and assistive listening system. A visual such as cart captions or a script and interpretation such as ASL. Different environments and different listing situations require different communication access accommodations. Brad talked a little bit about hearing aids, and I want to take that another step further. So when you get a hearing aid, one of the most important tools that you can get in your hearing aid is called a telecall. That's T-E-L-E-C-O-I-L. -E -E and a telecall really expands the usefulness of your hearing aid and allows you to use a variety of assistive technology. Especially useful is the assistive technology that is available in public spaces like the Paramount Theater, the Seattle Route, the Seattle Library. You need a telecall in your hearing aid to be able to use that equipment effectively. Um, assistive listening devices include personal amplifiers, remote microphones, and, and there's something to help you hear better on the telephone and the TV. 
Um, I'll just show this up to you. This is a remote microphone that I'm using, and this is another remote microphone. And someone can wear this right on their lapel, and I can hear them much better. Now, the key is, is the microphone. So if I move my microphone away, you can tell that it's not as easy to hear. So if you you really want to make sure that you use these microphones right next to the person who's speaking. Assistive listening systems are, are usually found in public spaces. I have an assistive listening system in my home because I entertain large groups of people who have hearing loss. These assistive listening systems include FM systems and infrared systems, and my favorite system, which is a hearing loop. A hearing loop uh, is these systems are usually set up where there's amplified sound. But with a hearing loop, I can simply change the program on my hearing aid, and what you speak say into the microphone goes directly into my hearing aid. This means I don't need to stop at an information counter to pick up assistive additional equipment and pair it with my hearing aid. This means I can walk in late when I go to a meeting. I can sit on the back row, simply switch my hearing aid and hear clean, pure sound, just like everyone else in the room. Here's a fun fact. The same way the Americans with Disabilities Act mandates ramps and curb cuts for people with mobility issues, the ADA mandates assistive listening systems in public venues for people with hearing loss. Hearing loops are the only systems that is directly compatible with hearing aids. Captions are a visual form of communication access and can be provided different ways given the venue. For example, live events use CART, and that's communication access real time technology. And this is where a person types captions in real time. Trains use visual meeting platform, um, trains use electronic reader boards which spell out announcements. And then on virtual meeting platforms like Teams, Zoom, and Google Meet, artificial intelligence generates captions in real time. And the good news is, is this technology is rapidly improving in accuracy. Next slide, please. Let's see. Um, I think I'm, can we go down one more slide? Okay. So our hearing loss goes with us everywhere. Um, the goal of communication access is to have the right accommodation in all places where we live, work, and play. Government at all levels have a responsibility to ensure that people with hearing loss can participate equally. And the solutions, the technology is available. It just takes a commitment to do it and to do it right. Next slide, please. Well, I am happy to report that several local government offices and public venues in Seattle and King County have done it right. HLAA Washington and our partner, Loop Seattle, has collaborated with several groups and organizations to get hearing loops installed. And we're really excited to announce that the city of Seattle is setting up hearing loops at the COVID vaccination center at Lumen Field. There'll be hearing loops at either end and I'm asking for tablets for captions. So I'll let you know about that. There are loops in the Seattle, Bellevue, city council chambers and the King County council chambers. The Seattle rep has loops in their box office, their concierge, all the concessions, and in all the theaters. This is particularly useful not just for patrons, but for volunteers and staff who may also have hearing loss so that they can easily and effectively communicate with patrons. 
Town Hall Seattle has loops in all three of their performance spaces. The Coleman Ferry Terminal and several areas at SeaTac Airport are now looped. Children's Hospital and Virginia Masons both have looped auditoriums and Swedish has a looped auditorium, clinic and several help desks. There are a number of senior communities and places of worship and other venues in the Seattle area that also have hearing loops. You can get a complete list on the Loop Washington Let's Loop Seattle website. Loop Washington is part of an HLAA communications access program called Get in the Hearing Loop. We continuously work with cities, public venues, and other organizations to promote hearing loops. We also assist with the planning and the installation to ensure the systems meet quality standards. We work with the public cities and venues and other organizations to promote hearing loops, and we assist with the planning and the installation to ensure the systems meet public, uh, to meet performance standards. And really the people with hearing loss are the best people to test the assistive listening systems. Next slide, please. Lastly, I want to let you know about our legislative advocacy work. We partner with organizations like the Senior Lobby, Disability Rights Washington, Aging and Long-Term Support Administration to educate policymakers and to advocate for hearing friendly laws. Most recently, we were successful in getting a hearing aid consumer protection bill passed. What this does is this requires hearing aid This requires hearing aid professionals to provide information about Bluetooth technology and telecall technology before you uh, are fitted with a hearing aid. This is very important because many professionals were, have been providing hearing aids that don't have telecalls. And this is a real problem because folks are unable to use the assistive listening systems that have been put in place throughout the state. Um, the next, the other uh, legislation that we've been successful in getting passed is the getting the legislature and the governor to provide funding for real time captions on TVW, the government cable TV channel. And we helped get a law passed that requires public televisions to be set with the captions on. We've also worked to get laws passed to ensure that workers in long-term care facilities are trained to care for people with hearing loss and that adults on Medicaid have a benefit to cover hearing aids. Next slide, please. A fight we are still waging is for the Washington State Insurance Commission to mandate private insurers to cover hearing aids. The price of hearing aids is beyond many Americans. This is especially challenging for families because as children grow, they need new devices. But for children with hearing loss, hearing aids are essential for cognitive and social development and hearing and, and without hearing aids, these kids are left behind. Young or old, or somewhere in between, everyone who needs a hearing aid should be able to have one. If you need financial support to purchase a hearing aid, there are resources listed on the HLAA Washington website. Next slide, please. In conclusion, if we are going to age well, we must hear well. If Seattle is truly going to be age friendly, we must also be hearing friendly. HLAA Washington is here to help. Let's work together to make hearing loss visible. Take action to speak openly about hearing loss. Let's get help to the people who need it. 
take action and share HLAA Washington resources with people you know who have hearing loss and share the good news that they can still live well. Let's make Seattle a leader in communication access, take action to identify where hearing loops and other communication access options could benefit people with hearing loss, and advocate for hearing friendly laws and policies. Together, we can make a huge difference for over 1.5 million Washingtonians with hearing loss. And thanks again for the opportunity today. And you guys have all been listening to us for a while, so we'd love to hear from you. And Lenny, I guess, do you want to start the Q&A? Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Sherry. And thank you for, uh, for everyone who is uh, sticking around a little bit longer today. Um, uh, in a moment, we'll, we'll have interpreter change, but I just wanted to mention, uh, I see some folks are, are, are leaving and others are actually coming in. Uh, for everyone, this will eventually end up on our YouTube channel and uh, any of the questions that we don't get to uh, or that you may have after we're finished live streaming, please uh, do consider subscribing to our channel. Uh, and once this video is uploaded, you can ask these questions uh, and provide your comments uh, in the comment section and we will then pass it along to our panel to respond and address. So at this time, uh, let us go ahead and switch interpreters so we can start the Q&A. So why don't we get started with one of the questions uh, that I saw come across there. Well, one, of the, one of the questions was a comment saying how Diana's presentation was excellent. Um, the other one was a request from a colleague who distributes uh, these types of uh, uh, information uh, bits. Uh, and, and that request was for Sherry, which was to please forward the information about uh, loops at vaccination sites uh, so that uh, our colleague could distribute that information. Um, so uh, I have a question here from a participant. And let me see. Um, the question was about masks. Uh, the question is, do you feel clear masks are effective? Um, and I'm assuming this for effective for communication. The person says that they heard mis mixed reviews uh, on that. And uh, who on the panel would like to address that question? So, so this is Sherry and I can go ahead and answer that question. Um, you know, that there's kind of a mixed bag. The, um, it, it is nice to be able to see a person's face and mouth, but it depends a lot on the particular person, the mask, and then the person's hearing loss as to how well they can hear. I think moving forward, the goal would be to develop clear masks that um, do not, um, limit the speech, the transfer of speech sounds, and that all the, um, that everyone could wear, especially in those in the healthcare field. I think that would be the goal. It's kind of a mixed bag right now, and it just really depends on the person and um, the situation. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I would add. I would add to that. Um, yeah, the, the 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 advantage of the clear mask is if you rely on lip reading, you get some information. The downside is when we look at the um, blockage of sound of all the different kinds of masks, the plastic uh, window tends to be w the worst of the them all. Now, the upside is there have been several studies in the last couple of months that have looked very specifically at how much each different kind of mask material blocks sound at different frequencies. And so what I do when I see people 
for hearing aid adjustments is we have a conversation about which masks they encounter the most. And I create individual programs in their hearing aids so that when they are with somebody with a, say, a surgical mask, for example, they have a program they can set. And I've adjusted their hearing aid to provide additional amplification at the frequencies where that particular mask material would attenuate them. That's something that is very easy to do for anybody who adjusts your hearing aids. And the information is readily available to those providers with a quick Google search. Um, and I'm happy to provide to Lenny, um, maybe offline, uh, a good infographic that I have on that that can guide those providers in providing, and I'll, I'll typically have maybe one or two different uh, mask programs that I'll build for people. And that just creates a, 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 a secondary um, benefit. So for that clear mask, if the provider does have it, we compensate for the, the loss of hearing, and then they get the enhanced hearing plus they get the visual and it's a benefit. So. I agree 100% with Sherry. It's a mixed bag. I don't know that we'll ever get a material that doesn't attenuate sound, but we can be more um, forward thinking and we can be more, and I would encourage the individuals watching this to ask your hearing aid provider, hey, can you make me a couple of mask programs and go out and, and bring to your appointment some new masks of the types that you have the most trouble with and then at the very least, have the provider look at this reference, put on that, this is what I do, I, I, I set it based on the reference, then I put on the, the surgical mask, for example, and I say a standard sentence, and we adjust the hearing aid for the blue mask, and then I put on the black cloth mask, and we make another program. And it takes you know 15 minutes, it's not a big deal, but it makes a huge difference for that person to be able to say, wow, Okay, now I know I can handle this. Thank you, Brad, and, and thank you, Sherry, for addressing this. Um, Diana, anything to add on that question? I sort of have, it, it's just unfortunate the whole mask situation is necessary for to, to be healthy, but it, it's, it's not comfortable. And I, I, uh, I put, I, I have a lot of programs on my hearing aids and I try to uh, put, put on the loudest program at the loudest it can be. And uh, I just have a problem of, uh, of hearing, of hearing people. Thank you, Diana. Um, that, uh, you know, it, it, it's an important question because we're, we're not, uh, as we as we heard earlier on the coronavirus update, we're not out of the woods yet. And, and so it's important, um, you know, being healthy is important, but it's also important that, you know, our communication is effective. So uh, clearer masks is a step. I've seen politicians use uh, those uh, during their press conferences. Uh, uh, and that was impressive. I, that's not something I expected to, to, to see. So that's, that's great. Um, there's a few more questions that I think we can do and then we have to wrap it up because of uh, the interpreter availability. Uh, and, and so um, the, both of these questions are from the same uh, audience member, actually. Uh, I think uh, Dina is uh, the, the name of the person. Uh, first is, is more of a resource question. So I'm wondering if uh, uh, one of you could uh, put that in the chat and then the moderators can put it in the audience chat. Uh, the question is, where can we get a list of resources for online hearing tests and apps? So while uh, somebody is putting that into uh, the WebEx chat here, let me ask the question next. If you have mild to moderate hearing loss, do you think it's worth it to wait for FDA approval for over-the-counter devices. And who would like to address that on the panel? You know, the FDA um, pro is, is a problem because I have heard uh, people stating uh, we're, uh, the earliest that we're going to get the regulations finished is uh, spring of 
2022. I, uh, I've I've heard lots of different rumors. I uh, one uh, thing which I don't think is a rumor, but I can't uh, is that the regulations have now been drafted, but the uh, the FDA is uh, is is seeking legal approval of them. I think that that came out of a representative's. Uh, office in Washington, D.C. So, but still, after that, even if they are almost ready to get approved, then they have to put them on the internet and then people have a long period to give comments. And then they, then they, after that, I think they have 180 days to, uh, to make changes. Uh, so it is going to be a long time. Thank you, Dan. Anything else to add? folks um you know that's that i always i hear that a lot is it worth it to wait is it worth it to wait i think that the reality is that if the primary reason you're looking at an over-the-counter solution is cost then uh there are options available that uh, depending on your income depending on your situation there are several programs that might be able to help you. HSDC has a department called Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services. Um, and if somebody's, uh, you know, curious about finding out more, uh, they're, uh, we're happy to have to help them navigate some of that. I think HLAA can also kind of help with that. Um, if their primary reason to do over the counter is they want to be um, a technology disruptor, that's a different conversation altogether. But if hearing loss is interfering with your ability to hear and understand, at least get in front of somebody who can have a conversation with you about possible technology solutions. And it might be something like an assistive hearing technology that's not a hearing aid. Um, but I, I don't know that I would just say, you know what, I'm just going to keep waiting. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Because the, the problem with over-the-counter hearing aids is we don't even know what they're going to look like. They could be versions of what a hearing aid is, but it could be a software package only that runs through your iPhone and your uh AirPods. So we don't know because we, as Diana says, we don't have the FDA uh, structure yet. So I would encourage anybody who's thinking of waiting for the F, just get in somebody who can have an intelligent conversation with you about how much hearing loss is impacting what domains of your life, right? And then we'll figure out what are the obstacles to you obtaining hearing aids, and we can work on kind of lowering those obstacles. Yeah, I I can give a, another comment. Um, it's not going to be clear. Um, on the internet, you have some things that are advertised. They're called amplifiers or PSAPs, and some of them are probably very similar to to, uh, to, to hearing aids. The pro uh, the really cheapest ones don't work. With the ones that are, are costing a little bit more, they are not. Uh, regulated by the, the FDA, the federal, um, which is the department that regulates hearing aids. And so where is regular hearing aids, when you get them from a professional, you know that they won't get too loud. These PSAPs that are advertised, some of them may not be uh, uh, too loud, but some of them are. And, and so you don't have a guarantee that you're not going to get one that makes sound too loud. It can do further damage to your hearing. One, one small clarification. So I agree with Diana that there's stuff sold on the internet that's an amplifier. There if something is specifically called a personal sound amplification product or a PSAP, that actually is a, a regulated device through the FDA. So there's a classification for devices through the FDA called PSAPs. There are hearing aids, and then there's this nebulous thing in the middle of amplifiers. Um, and so again, I think the, the, the take home is get in front of somebody who can have an intelligent conversation with you about the impact of your hearing on your life, 
who has a vested interest in helping you, don't go buy a bunch of stuff and try it out on the internet. Have, have at least one person who has your best interest in mind in the conversation with you. And HLAA can be that person. HSDC can be that person. Um, and I think that um, there's lots of resources in, in the Seattle area that can help depending on what, again, what the obstacle is and how much each of those obstacles are impeding your access to better communication. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ingro. And unless there's uh, uh, anything else to add, I, I know that you're, you've posted some links there, Sherry, um, that we will pass along to the live Q&A. Um, anything to add to, to, this, uh, to this question? I guess I mentioned, I mentioned earlier that the uh, the HLA Washington website has some uh, suggestions. There's a program in town where you can borrow money from. University of Washington uh, used to have reconditioned hearing aids, and they were available uh, to people on Medicaid. But since now, if you're on Medicaid, you can get hearing aids, uh, you know, for for free through Medicaid, they're now uh, developing standards for uh, for who will be eligible for those reconditioned uh, hearing aids. And I I just spoke to a person within the last two weeks on that, so I think I'm pretty current. All right. Well, thank you so much, Diana. Uh, we we have to leave it there. Um, we um, we thank uh, all of our um, panelists. Today, uh, Diana Thompson, Dr. Brad Ingro, and Sherry Perizzoli for being here today. Um, let's uh, uh, have another interpreter switch, um, and uh, I, I will uh, uh, lead us out for the day. Uh, not switching. We're going. We're, we're continuing. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, in, in that case, uh, I want to take uh, a moment to actually thank our interpreters. Uh, they, they've provided an invaluable service and this is something we uh, haven't done before, but are now becoming more experienced at uh, and with, uh, with apologies for some of the less uh, smooth production, but with, with hopefully uh, some uh, communication that was improved through this process. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, next and last slide. And one more. Uh, these are, this is the, uh, this was the uh, contact information for our speakers. We're gonna post that in the live Q and A, but also, when you go to watch this on our YouTube channel, somebody asked again what the, uh, what the channel is called. It's called Aging King County. We're Age Friendly Seattle, but Aging King County is the name for the entity, for the, for the, the area agency on aging for Seattle and King County. So it's called Aging King County, and that's the name of our YouTube channel. You can find this video there in about a week's time. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to continue asking questions there. And again, we will make sure to alert uh, today's panelists. And speaking of panelists, I want to invite you to come back a month from now uh, in June, on June 3rd, 2021, for uh, another uh, close to home panel. We don't always have these as, as panels, by the way. Um, and usually they run an hour or at least 90 minutes. Today we went a, a lot longer. Thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, we will be starting to celebrate Pride Month in, in June. So on the 3rd at 10.30 a.m., we will be welcoming uh, panelist Jason Plourd, who is the project manager of the AMP AIDS Memorial Path Pathway, Amy Cunningham uh, from Asian with Pride Idea at the University of Washington School of Social Work, and a return appearance from Stephen Nip, executive director of Gen Pride. So uh, please mark your calendars. Uh, the access information is the same. Uh, and the reminder that with any questions that go beyond what those panelists will cover, what the panelists covered today, or uh, what we heard about from the library, uh, you know, 
You can always call Community Living Connections. It's at 844-348-5464. Uh, and and, and they, can, they can help uh, connect you with a community resource. We, we thank you again for joining us. Thank you for, to, to all of you for, for being here uh, on a fairly sunny afternoon. Now it's an afternoon. And we hope to see you again in a couple of weeks uh, uh, or another time at one of these age-friendly live events. We, we thank you. Uh, I won't speak my Russian uh, greeting uh, or, or outward today because we have interpretation that will not work. So have a good day. We'll talk to you very, very soon. Take care, everybody.